One of the things I, I love just in the protocols that, that are there is just this sense of um, a lot of them, there, there's the navigation of the gift and the, the release of the gift, but as much about who we are as people right. and that place of integrity and that place of character. Like you, you mentioned, you know, the messenger is the message, right. the prophet is the prophecy and realizing how much our lives are intertwined with that. Yeah. Um, I, I really appreciated something that John Sanford did at a number of years ago. He was doing a prophetic school and uh, I was looking at getting the recordings of it. And so I asked somebody and, and you know, not him, but one of his, one of his staff and they're like, well, we, that's only available to people that have gone through the ministry training on inner healing. Okay. Because he didn't want to do the training on the prophetic to people that hadn't gone through some healing right. because right. of the errors, the issues that it would cause. Yeah. There was such a high value for a healed heart. Yeah. And the, the more that I pursue the healing of my heart, the, the easier it is for me to actually recognize when it's God speaking, when it's not God right. speaking and taking it to the root of those issues right. and, and making that a major focus. Right. I mean, when I want to get another level of the prophetic, if you will use that language, a lot of it has to do like what part of my heart isn't healed to allow the light of God to shine fully. Right. What, what's twisting that light? What's, what's darkening that light? What's filtering that light? Right. Because the pure my heart is, the more likely I am to actually hear the pure word of the Lord. Right. And the, it's easy to become to, for the word to become tainted, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. it is. Yeah. And so that, that state of the heart is it's so key to, to healthy prophetic yeah. ministry. Well, one pastor I worked with years ago, he had a great saying that uh, if we're not healed up, someone says pears and we hear bears, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and so it's not only a person giving the word, but um, it's also uh, what filters are we receiving it? No, and that's, mm -hmm. uh, John Sanford was obviously not only uh, ministered prophetically and a prophet, but I think he was prophetic in a, in a way that a lot of people that you mentioned uh, haven't understood that he was also very, very strong on working with healing of the heart, healing of the soul, healing of damaged emotions, and bringing to a point of helping people come to a point of wholeness where they could function yeah. as a, a healthy uh, mouthpiece for God. You know? Um, you know, all of us have had different experiences in school where, you know, we might not remember anything from our uh, fifth grade, but maybe there's just one thing, one lesson. Uh, and I remember, I think it was my fifth grade teacher, uh, you know, in fifth grade, you know, how, you know, you really don't have that much discernment to say, well, this is important, I'm hanging on to this. But she, she said something just as in, uh, she wasn't even really, it, it really didn't have to do with the topic. I think she was talking about issues in, in our class, you know, and she said, Usually the problem we cause with words is not what we say, but it's how we say it. And uh, I've never forgotten that. Yeah. Uh, and I look at what Jesus said, the good man, this would include the good woman, speaks of the treasure stored up within their heart. Proverbs 4.23, watch over your heart with all diligence because life flows from it. And so we, we think about words flowing from uh, treasure stored up in the heart, but if there's a lot of toxicity there, if there are laws of anger, bitterness, fear of man, uh, rejection, uh, it's, it's like taking some really pure, healthy water, the living waters of the Holy Spirit, metaphorically, and pouring into a glass that has about a half inch of dirt, debris at the bottom. Well, no one wants to drink that. And so uh, it's not only affecting some of the words, but it affects the overall ministry and people getting back to this problem, people are hearing what they want to hear. You know, we mentioned, um, uh, you brought up the whole issue of pride, um, uh, you know, because I've, I've been involved in this kind of arena since the early 80s of 
uh, been around globally and seen different things, but like a lot of people, I can remember very clearly uh, 1998, 1999, all the fear of what was going to happen with Y2K, you know, yeah. the turn of the clock at uh, going into the, the new millennium. And first it was the computer gurus and technicians. They began to put out warnings to banks and, you know, all of this that uh, we're going to be in trouble because our, uh, we're not sure our computers can handle the change, you know, the digital change. But then, uh, especially by early 1909, uh, you know, I, I don't use this term very often uh, because I'm not sure if there is a prophetic movement, but the so-called prophetic movement <laughs> was all over this. And not just, quote, prophesying that there was going to be global economic uh, catastrophe because all the computers are going to shut down and not function. Everything from water supply was going to be cut off to, you know, uh, police and firemen can't respond to emergencies. Your bank account's going to be lost. And um, uh, I'm not sure, well, you probably remember this, you're old enough, mm -hmm. but a lot of Christians were buying generators. They were storing up bottled water, canned goods, the whole nine yards. Oh, yeah. And I began to see uh, in line with that, that a number of churches that like, let's say, uh, had had a, a five year, really fruitful ongoing program of maybe working with kids from low income families, uh, train, helping to train them in different areas, or maybe com teaching computer literacy, things like that, or, you know, different avenues of evangelism there began to be such, um, uh, you know, a milieu of confusion, like a whirlwind of confusion, what was going to happen. A lot of things stopped. Mm -hmm. And uh, all of a sudden, the mandate of seek first the kingdom of God, you know, that got left behind of, oh, God, we've got to go into this preservation mode. And, okay, well, well that's one issue. But the other, is the other side of the prophetic word, a lot of the prophetic voices said was, not only is this going to be this economic crisis, but God's going to use it to bring in a great revival because there's going to be such a desperation for God. Well, obviously that did not happen. And I think uh, you and I talked about this the other day that yeah. you were watching, you know, the turn of the clock that I think yeah. was... I was working at the bank at the time. Yeah. And so we were you know, like, we had no idea what was going to happen. So we already had it set on our calendars. Like we were watching what happened when it hit the dateline. And the first time it turned, like what was going on in Australia, what was going on in yeah. Asia as it touched their computers. And so by the time I got to work the next morning, which we all got there like three hours early, just in case we had yeah. to deal with yeah. stuff. No problem. Nothing, nothing so, happened. So <laughs> we had uh, a lot of well-known prophetic voices prophesying there was going to be crises, but it's interesting. Their so-called revelation followed people in the secular arena. Yes saying that, which should have, the red flag should have gone that right should have there. Been the red flag. And then secondly, they said that, uh, but don't be worried. God's going to use this for revival. Well, neither right. one happened. Yeah. Now that's, to me, that's not the problem because I always come from the posture of someone prophesies something and I'm the recipient of it or I'm a hero. Okay. I'm going to pray into it. Do I have a conviction? And yeah. throughout 98, 99, and I, I never think of myself as the in all and end all that because I'm not hearing something that's not going to happen. Uh, but uh, every time I prayed about it, I thought, gee, a lot of my friends are prophesying this, and guys I'm doing conferences with are prophesying this, you know. Um, I prayed about it quite a bit, and I just had this overwhelming peace of God. Not just a peace that, uh, you know, everything's going to go crazy, but somehow I'm going to survive it, you know, but the peace that, no, it, it's not going to happen. Um, and again, I, uh, uh, I don't mean to sound like, I got it right and everybody else got it wrong. That's not my point. But the point is, everything is prophesied. We need to take it and pray into it. And then in the aftermath throughout the year 2000, um, very few people who'd had a loud voice or a larger platform who prophesied these things were going to happen, very few of them came back and said, you know, gosh, I thought I was hearing from the Lord. I want to ask forgiveness if... You know, you went out and bought three generators you didn't need or, you know, uh, you as a leader uh, stopped some areas of vital ministry because you thought you've got to store up the church basement, you know, with, you know, there was, there was none of that. And it gets back to, well, don't ask me to apologize, you know. Right. And uh, I think in uh, one aspect of having um, 
particularly prophets uh, who, uh, by all basic accounts, uh, have growing eyes to see and ears to hear in the Holy Spirit. If anyone should have a growing revelation of the majesty, the holiness, the authority, the power of El Shaddai, God Almighty, the Father, the person of Jesus, the Holy Spirit in our midst, it should be prophetic people. But there was almost um, almost a flippancy. Well, you know, we thought we were hearing from God. We missed it, so let's, let's just go on. Business as usual. And I saw firsthand a number of churches I was working with particularly in Europe and uh, some of the UK, that had theologically they'd been open to the gift spirit, but never really practiced gifts right. over a five year, 10 year time, really go deeper into the prophetic. They saw all this and heard all this and said, you know, kind of like what we've, we've been experiencing the last right. few months over yeah. the, uh, I'm out. Trump's gonna <laughs> win. Uh, if, yeah. if this is prophecy, we've got enough confusion already. We don't need to pile it on, you know? Right. <laughs> So I don't know about training and equipping our people in our church, you know, despite the fact that it's part of our priesthood, the young men and women will prophesy to us dream dreams, despite the fact that every church should have some sort of ongoing training knowing the voice of the Lord. Um, all, all of, uh, again, to me, the problem is not missing that, but without any loving accountability or sense of responsibility. Yeah, yeah, and that, that's the key. So let's say you had a young woman or young man that you were mentoring, they were budding in the prophetic ministry and they missed a prophetic word. What would be your suggestion? How would they prophes uh, how would they apologize? Who would they apologize to? Like how would you walk them through that? What what suggestions would you give or what would you do yourself in that situation? Yeah, what, well let's talk about me, you know, because uh, I'm not infallible. <laughs> um to the degree that um, that prophecy had an audience or the vision, uh, you know, uh, the bigger the venue or whatever, the bigger the internet spread or the church, to that degree, uh, and also take into account, uh, did this prophetic word bring real disappointment? Yeah. Uh, did it bring heartache? Did it bring a lot of confusion? Um, did it bring discouragement? Um, that speaks about the seriousness of the apology. You know, all apologies obviously should be serious, but my gosh, you know, uh, I think I, uh, I may have shared it the other day uh, when you and I were doing the dialogue in the uh, meetings. Um, uh, in the first part, the first six or seven years of uh, the Lord began to take me internationally, we began to see a number of significant uh, healings and even miracles with women who were uh, pregnant that had been told you're going to lose the baby. And uh, probably had about five of those situations where I prayed for them and almost immediately the baby, the doctor could tell the baby was completely healthy and the babies were born completely healthy. So this is exciting, you know. Mm -hmm. And then I was speaking at a conference in uh, Malmo, Sweden, and I'd done a lot in Malmo, Sweden in those years, and the growing sense of unity, and we had like eight or nine churches come together in what they called the Dome, the Lutheran State Church, the Cathedral, and we'd have four nights with a focus on worship, uh, what is the Lord saying, prophecy, and healing. And um, one of those years, uh, uh, they made known to me there was a couple there by six months pregnant or something, and they'd been told the baby was gonna die you know, in the womb. Uh, and so uh, I jumped the gun, not just got ahead of the Lord, but got outside what God was saying. And I prophesied in the meeting publicly that uh, not only was the baby going to live, but the, the call of God upon this child in the future, you know. And, and so a year later, and, and again, I had an ongoing history with these churches. A year later, we're back doing meetings again, but uh, I got there a day before the meetings began and uh, several of the pastors, we went out to lunch or dinner or whatever. And they said, Mark, we're just so glad you're back. You know, we just so appreciate these annual things we do. I said, but you need to be aware of one thing. And very graciously, they brought up to me what had happened and the baby had in fact died. Uh, and the couple had lost the baby. Now, uh, you know, you, you can, 
you can try to wiggle through that. Well, they didn't have faith or things like that. But I maintain that if someone who's sick has enough faith for, to let you pray for them, you know, they've at least got faith the size of a mustard seed. Yeah. So I think we need to avoid kind of cop-outs like that. Right. And I think, again, if we're representing God Almighty, we always need to take the higher road, you know, representing the nature of God, not just the uh, events God is speaking about. So I said, well, gosh, would it be possible to, for me to meet with a couple? And they said, yeah, um, what about if we meet for coffee about an hour before the first meeting? And so I met with a couple and they were very, very gracious. But I, I apologize, said, gosh, I want to apologize for the false hope I gave you and the false words and whatever heartache it caused. Then you'd been expecting the baby to die. And then you believed on that word, the baby's going to be healthy. And then you went through the heartache of a baby passing. And again, they were very gracious, they forgave. Um, and I even mentioned, uh, the pastors did not ask me to do this, but because I'd had so much visibility with these eight or nine mm -hmm. churches, I, I, I took the initiative and I, I, I brought up at some point in one of those three or four nights, uh, you may remember last year I had this and I just wanna to apologize to everybody for missing it. Mm -hmm. And it, rather than I think being, oh my gosh, you know, uh, made a mistake. Yeah. When people see someone who, you know, uh, has, uh, they respect with a certain love anointing, could be a teaching ministry, prophecy, evangelism, whatever, that they say, wow, they're like me, they're human, you know, it gives them hope. Um, I'm sure you teach on this quite a bit, but I call it the Proverbs 14.4 principle, where there are no oxen, the right. stable is clean, but where there's much oxen, there's much strength. And the missing ingredient there is, if you don't understand that, you've got to go visit a farm where there's, you, know, you have a lot of oxen, there's a lot of stuff to clean up. And the point of all that is that if we want the strength of certain gifts, certain attributes in life and in the church, there's always going to be messes to clean up. Yeah. And not only uh, have I heard many, many pastors say over the years, well, I believe in the prophecy, I like prophecy, but I just don't want it happening in the church, there's too many messes. Well, I, I believe that's, um, it's, that's missing out on the bigger blessing yeah. that per, the per life of the prophetic can bring to a church and to lives. But also, I think that we need to be aware that if we're called to a translocal ministry or to a wider arena, that, yeah, praise God, there's going to be strength. But if there's going to be messes, let's be responsible. Let's help clean them up, right. you know. And I think um, when... Uh, folks that are beginning to grow in the prof in prophecy but are afraid mis making mistakes, when they say, well, gosh, you know, this person has been such a blessing prophetically or whatever, and they acknowledge they made a mistake and they're continuing on, you know, in a good sense, that gives me hope. Yeah, yeah, it does. Actually, when I was, um, I'm thinking of a, a church that I, I used to be familiar with, not super familiar as in I, I didn't personally go there, but the, just the reputation. When I was in Phoenix, Arizona, and just learning about it, I'd just come into the things of the kingdom. I'd gone through the art of hearing God with John Paul Jackson, and I was starting to be known as, as the prophetic guy in the yeah. church uh, that was there and um, you know, pressing into it. I had people that were talking about some of the prophetic history in Phoenix. And there was a particular church there that in the 80s, late 80s, up to the early 90s, was known as kind of the place that had conferences. They'd have prophetic people come in, they'd have different things that go on, and growing, thriving church, some great things is going on. Well, the pastor, the leader, um, I, he called himself pastor, so we'll call him pastor, uh, he, he decided he was prophetic. And he would get these prophetic words and, you know, hey, you know, next Sunday is, you know, God's glory is going to be coming. It's the great revival. We've been waiting for this. And then the next Sunday would happen and nothing happened. Yeah. And then he would beat everybody up. He goes, I gave you the prophetic word, but you didn't believe it. That's why nothing's happened. You didn't pray hard enough. You, it, exactly. Yeah. And he, it was not just a one or two time thing. It happened so consistently. It killed the church. Hmm. I drove past just because I, I mean, I'm so hungry for any place that God moved. And there were so many miracles and things that had happened. Yeah. And there been it, and there was a move of God that had happened at this location. So I went to this building 
that was now empty. And, but it was just so sad yeah. seeing that. Right. That church died because the prophetic word was not actually prophetic. And there wasn't any accountability. He didn't take it and, and apologize. He didn't take any responsibility. And there was a stronghold of pride. Yeah. It was a stronghold of pride. Yeah. And when we, when we don't actually take that place of, you know, hey, I thought this is what I heard. I didn't hear. You know, I thought that I heard that it was going to happen this way, and it didn't happen this way. It's going to happen this other way. Right. It, it, that might be. Yeah. But if if I get a prophetic word and I don't say, hey, if you pray, this is going to happen. I just say this is going to happen and it doesn't happen. Even if the Lord tells me, you know, it didn't happen because there wasn't enough prayer. I'm responsible because I didn't say I, I said that it was going to happen. Right. I didn't say if you pray. Right. So I didn't give them what they needed to step into the prophetic word. Right. I'm responsible for missing that prophetic word. Right. They're not responsible right. for not praying because they were not told. Right. Now, could they have prayed? Could they have asked the Lord themselves? Yeah, yeah, that's completely. But I can't do anything about anybody else. Right. I'm only responsible for myself. The self-control is the fruit of the spirit, not other control. Right. And spiritual <laughs> gifting doesn't give us other control. Right. It's supposed to give us more self-control. Right. And that that place, I think it, it's it's one of the huge issues that one it protects against spiritual abuse. Yeah. Because you know, I, I mean, I could tell story after story of, of the the hard things that have happened, and I mean, I could tell story after story of the beautiful things that have happened with the prophetic. So it's not right. one or the other. Right. But it protects from that spiritual abuse. It, it gives yeah. a sense of trust. Yeah. I mean, I, I've, I've been to Malmo and yeah. I've been to Sweden yeah. and I've talked with various different leaders yeah. across the country and the reputation that you have has nothing to do with, hey, he missed it. Mm -hmm. it it's, the, it's what you've brought to the church, how you strengthen the church, mm -hmm. what you sowed into the church. That's what they're remembering. That's what they talk about. Right. When when your name gets brought up mm -hmm. in Sweden. And we're afraid that if we apologize, that we're going to get known as the one that missed it. And the reality is, if we're afraid of being known as the one that missed it, that in itself tells us that's an there's issue, a root there. Yeah. Yeah. There's something that's unhealthy. Yeah. The orphan spirit. Yeah. Yeah. 